Hey, how's it going? This is Joe Intel, and today I'm going to be talking about how I set up Odyssey on my Denon X4500H. Before we get into it, here's a message from our show sponsor. PSB is a Canadian company started in 1972 by Paul Barton and stands for Paul and Sue Barton. PSB speakers are sold in more than 70 countries worldwide. I've heard about PSB speakers before, but it wasn't until I unboxed and checked out their PSB Alpha P5 speakers and their M4U8 wireless active noise canceling headphones that I realized that these guys mean business. Check out the selection of speakers on their website. They have no compromise flagship speakers in their Imagine series and affordable bookshelf speakers like their Alpha line. Right now they're doing a giveaway for a pair of the M4U8 wireless active noise canceling headphones. Enter for your chance to win. Link to the contest down below. So although this guide is for my Denon X4500H, this will also work on the X3600 and also some of the newer Denon and Marantz models. Just check to see if it's compatible with the Odyssey Multi-EQ app. Step one is to set up the speakers in your room. Room EQ is not a replacement for proper speaker placement and room treatment. Step two is to download the app on iOS or Android. The price right now is $19.99 and I think it's totally worth it. Before I had the X4500H, I had the previous 4100W, and that model wasn't compatible with this new app. And before, if I wanted to be able to set my curves and do some of the stuff that this app is able to do, I had to have a calibrator come and do it, and that would cost a couple hundred bucks. Step three is to plug in the setup mic and to set up this cardboard rocket ship looking thing. If you happen to have a mic stand, that might be better since it does have threads on the bottom. So step four is to just basically follow the instructions on the app. And the first thing you wanna do is tell it how many speakers you have and what kind of setup you have. In my case, it's 5.1.2 setup and you might have something different. Set it accordingly. Then it's gonna ask you to set the levels on your sub. And that's because your sub has its own amplifier and it can't push or pull that too far. So you need to kind of get that right from the get-go. Next thing is make sure that the room is quiet. You don't want to have people talking or your AC blowing or any other types of noise. You want to pretend like you're about to sit down and watch a movie. So step five is take the time to do all the measurements. In my case, it asks to do eight measurements, although it will let you stop at three, four, five, six, seven measurements. But in my experience, I find that it's better if I let it do all of the measurements. Just go ahead and let it do that. It takes a little time, but it's worth it. The app will tell you where to place the mic next. Make sure to not go too far left, right, forward, or backwards. It says here two feet away maximum. So after it's done doing all those measurements, it's gonna do some calculations, and it's gonna try to tell you what it thinks your speaker should be set at as far as whether it should be set at large or small, or the distance, or the crossover point. Make sure that all those things make sense, that they're logical and that they're not too far off. If they are, you may have to go and redo the calibration or you might have to set those manually. One exception to that is that I've found that sometimes I get the subwoofer distance wrong and I think it's because it might have a few delays built into it based on the fact that the subwoofer has to go through its own processes. And so you might find that the subwoofer distance is not the correct distance, but I would say leave that as is. So step seven is decide whether you wanna use dynamic EQ and dynamic volume. So to be clear, dynamic EQ changes the equalization based on the loudness. And that has to do with the equal loudness contour curve that we've talked about before, which basically says that at lower volumes, you're not able to hear bass and treble as well as if you had it turned up. And so that feature will actually compensate for that. But in my experience, if I'm listening at lower volumes, I feel like it tends to boost the bass a little bit too much for my preference. And so I turn that off. Another benefit to turning that off is that it also gives you the option to use tone controls. And I think that for me, that's very important. I like to be able to tweak the bass and treble response, and that's fine because that is a shelving filter, and so feel free to use the tone controls. The dynamic volume is basically a compressor, so it takes the quietest sounds and the loudest sounds, and it makes them less different. So you're not gonna have a quiet scene and suddenly go to an extremely loud scene, it's gonna kinda of try to balance those two so nothing jumps out at you. For example, it comes in handy if I'm listening with my kids, my, my family, and we're just trying to relax and watch TV or something like that. 
when a loud commercial comes on, it kind of levels that out so it doesn't surprise anybody. It's also helpful because some of the source material, sometimes there's a variation between the loudness of those things, so it kind of keeps everything steady. But for me, when I'm listening to music or watching a movie, I want to have all the dynamics possible, right? I want it to go from quiet to real loud. I don't want to jump out of my seat. And with music as well, if it's supposed to be quiet, I want it to sound quiet. If it's loud, I want it to sound loud. Step eight is to save your untouched measurements. So you can make as many copies as you want and you can tweak those however you want. But in my opinion, it's a good idea to kind of save that original recorded calibration just for future use. So step nine, as I mentioned, you can make a ton of copies. So before you start messing around, go ahead and make a copy. So next thing is to set the roll off. I'm not too sure why they give this option. I would actually prefer to not have that roll off, but choosing between the two, I chose the first one because it doesn't roll off as soon. Step 11, I think is very important. Turn that mid-range compensation off. I don't know why they do that. Basically what it does is it introduces a dip around 2K, 2 kilohertz, and that's for speakers that maybe have a bad crossover. I, I don't really understand because if you have a good speaker, you don't want it to just put a notch there for you, right? That doesn't make sense. Maybe it's back from the home theater in the box days when they didn't have such great speakers. I'm not sure, but turn that off. So step 12 is optional. I usually keep this at flat, but set a house curve if you prefer. That's something that was only available when you had the pro version before and you had to have a calibrator come and do that for you. Now you can just do it yourself. So if you wanna introduce the Harman curve or whatever curve that you desire, just so it sounds good to you, this is the area to do it. And just to be clear, what a house curve is, is setting the target response. So built into the system, you have a flat response, so that's just flat. And then they have one called the reference curve, and I think that's just the X curve, which from what I've heard, different opinions saying that it's not really suitable for home use, but I haven't really seen what the response of that is, but you know, I just keep it at flat anyway typically. So step 13, this one to me is very important and that is to limit the filter response. So limit it to a certain amount. Before I used to let this just kind of run full range and that's what it does by default. It corrects from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and just does whatever it does. But after watching a new video from Audioholics, they explained that maybe you shouldn't tweak past a certain frequency because you may be making the sound worse. And so I struggled with that because I'd always done it, just let it do what it was doing, full range. And so their recommendation is experiment. Their recommendation was 500 hertz. I did some tests and I was able to get all the way up to 700 hertz without it being detrimental. So experiment and see where it sounds best for you. But I would say try to limit the filter response to somewhere around five to 700 hertz. Hertz. The result of that is I noticed that my speakers sounded more natural, they sounded more open, and they sounded less processed, they sounded less robotic. And the bass is really where it needs the most help, and that's why you wanna limit it. So step 14, set all the speakers to small. By default, if it detects that your speakers can go down to a certain frequency, it might set them to large, even if they're not large speakers. And this is very tricky because in my case, I have my speakers very close to the wall. It's not optimal. Because it's close to a wall, I'm getting some boundary reinforcement, and it's thinking that my speakers can actually play lower than they actually do. And so it's setting my mains to large, even though they're bookshelf speakers and should be set to small. Generally speaking, unless you have some big floor standing speakers that you know can get down to 20 hertz, you should probably set it to small. So step 15 is to set your crossover to 80 hertz. And that is just the point that most people recommend because 80 hertz is the point where bass starts to become omnidirectional, meaning you can't locate the bass. If something is playing in the right speaker and you have your sub on the left, you don't want to hear the bass from the left. You want the bass to sound like it's coming from the right speaker. And so that's the 80 hertz point. Now, Odyssey might detect that maybe your speakers can be crossed over at 40. Still, I would say experiment, try 80 hertz and see if that sounds a little bit better just because that will also free up your amp from having to do extra work, right? If you can cross it over at 80 versus 40 hertz, 
your amplifier power can go a longer ways. So you can, you'll, you'll be able to play your speakers louder without distortion. Just let the sub do what it's supposed to do, which is the low frequencies. Now, again, I'm speaking generally, if you have some big floor standing speakers that can get down to 20 Hertz, then yeah, you're not going to be using that 80 Hertz crossover, but still I would say experiment with it because let's say you do have those giant floor standing speakers just because they can play down to 20 Hertz. doesn't mean that that's the optimal place for those speakers, for the subs, right? Let's just call them subs inside of your floor standing speakers. Some people actually do have subwoofers in their main speakers. It doesn't mean that those are in the optimal place. So just experiment. Step 16, like I was saying earlier, make sure to set this to reference if you're using this app because flat in my experience did not work. If I were to do the calibration without the app, just using the receiver and the remote control, then yes, you can switch between flat and reference. And what they recommend is flat is better for music, reference for movies. I don't know. I don't know what the curves look like. So you be the judge on that one. So step 17 is to turn off all the extra processing. You know, when I first got my receiver, I would want to try everything on. I figured like, hey, if it's there, it might it's saying that it's going to make it sound better. Why not just turn it on? But in, after a while, I started noticing that those might not always be the best. It might actually degrade the sound. So the restore function where it makes MP3 supposedly restores them to a higher quality. I don't know if that that really does what it's supposed to do. And there's some surround processing functions there for center spread and for loudness compensation. My opinion is to turn all those off. That's how I have them set. Experiment, but I think it's best to turn those off. So step 18 is to listen to some music that you're very familiar with, something with some bass, with some vocals and some treble and see where you want to set those tone controls that I was talking about earlier. So set the bass, set the treble, make sure that it sounds right. Maybe just for your taste even. So what I would recommend is actually just change the treble in the tone control. And before changing the bass, see what happens if you change the subwoofer level, go ahead and turn that up or down to suit your preference. If after that you feel like it needs a little bit more bass, in the mid-range area, then play with the bass. So step 19 is to turn off the eco mode. I know we're all trying to be environmentally friendly, but I think that that just robs your amplifier of the maximum power. So if you don't mind that, then go ahead and turn it on. I want the most power possible, so I turn that feature off. So the final step is I set the four quick select presets. And what I use it for is I set one, for pure direct mode. The second one I use is just for watching TV. I allow it to have some of those nannies on there that, that adjust the volume, things like that, so that it doesn't get too loud. So for quick select three, I allow that to have no nannies whatsoever when I'm listening to music or watching a movie, and I just want the most dynamics possible. And the fourth quick select profile I use is for nighttime mode. So if my kids are sleeping, I can set it to that mode and it's actually set so it's for multi-channel stereo and that doesn't always work depending on the source. If it's an Atmos source, it's going to automatically switch that. But let's say if I'm watching YouTube, it'll switch to a multi-channel stereo in that mode. It has the front channels turned down and most of the sound is coming from the height and the rear channels and the subwoofer is turned down, the LFE, all the bass is turned down. And basically it just makes it easy to listen and watch a show without bothering my wife and kids if they're sleeping. And the bonus tip is after you're all done with that, tweaking your system, leave it alone. Just enjoy your system. I'm guilty of watching a movie and then I'll be there messing with the settings while we're about to watch a movie. And I would say, you know what? I'm going to try to do a better job of just relaxing and just enjoying my system. So anyway, that's it. I hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell to be notified when I upload new videos. And if you have any recommendations of your own, leave them in the comments below. Once again, I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters. Thank you for supporting me and allowing me to do what I love to do here on YouTube. If you're interested in becoming a patron, check it out at patreon.com forward slash Joe Anyway, that's it. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>